uh, two days before um, we left, uh, we were told we could call and say goodbye, but that was the extent. We, of course, we didn't know where we were going anyways. We had been issued tropical clothing, so we figured we were going to the Pacific. And of course, five days out at sea, they took the tropical clothing back and issued clothing for cold weather. And uh, so, no, we could just call and say goodbye, and, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And we were in this staging area, and, you know, they drummed into you, uh, loose lips sink ships, and uh, you just couldn't write anything. All the mail was censored from then on in. And uh, then we boarded our ship. As soon as we boarded our ship um, the next day, uh, and of course, then we had to get indoctrinated into shipboard routine. We had lifeboat drill and learn how to go through that. And um, then we were uh, put, we had eight nurses to a little stateroom. We had cot beds that were stacked in tiers in this tiny little room. You couldn't move around. Only one person could move in the room at a time, but we didn't dare complain because the enlisted men were packed like sardines in the hold of the ship, and every time you'd walk past the open entrance to the hold, the smell of vomitus was horrible. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't, we didn't complain at all. The hospital was finished, and we moved to uh, Penley Hall, which was the name of our place. And uh, then we started preparing for the D-Day invasion of France, and making sure we had all the supplies necessary. And uh, we nurses lived uh, eight to a hut. These were uh, little huts and um, with plots of grass in between. And uh, we each, uh, these huts each had a pot-bellied stove, and again, they were freezing. And uh, we had a, a latrine building down the block. Each, uh, uh, there were blocks of huts with sidewalks between, and then when you had to go to the latrine at night in the blackout, uh, and with the rain and the mud, you had to be careful where you were stepping. Yeah. But uh, just a, a few, a couple of weeks after D-Day, we got orders to proceed to Belgium, which was to be our final destination. And uh, that, but that took three months. We were three months en route getting to Belgium. So we received orders to pack up and be ready to leave in two hours. <laughs> so then uh, eventually um, we got orders uh, sometime in August, I think it was around August 9th or so, to proceed to Normandy. So we boarded the uh, SS Holland, which had been a, a luxury ship for crossing the channel. Well, normally it would take, would take two or three hours to cross the English Channel. It took us three days and three nights because the uh, channel so, yeah. uh, was so clogged with ships oh. and with sunken ships and airplanes. Wow. And uh, when we first got, a, got aboard the ship, uh, the mail officers uh, raced down to the staterooms. There weren't enough staterooms to accommodate everybody, so they were going to get them first. and. And a few minutes later, they came up. They were being very generous. They said, well, we'll let you nurses have the staterooms. We found out why they were full, filled with bed bugs. Oh. So we all slept up on deck for three nights. And of course, we had to observe complete blackout. German planes were still flying overhead. You couldn't you know, light a cigarette up on deck at all. And then on the third day, um, we... Uh, landed at Utah Beach, which was down the beach from Omaha Beach where the Americans had first landed. Right. And uh, we had to climb over the railing. Uh, here we're loaded down with all of our equipment and uh, it was difficult climbing down this swaying rope ladder. But that was something we had practiced in basic training at Fort Devens, so we were prepared for it. You know, as the, the waves uh, hit the side of the ship and then the, the rope ladder would sway and here you're trying to hang on yeah. loaded down with all your gear but uh, we made it into these flat bottom boats and uh, then it took us to within a couple hundred feet of the shore and then we got out and waited in the rest of the way and they loaded us into trucks 
and we drove off through the Normandy countryside. And, uh, you know, as we drove over the pothole roads and saw for the first time uh, almost every, all these small French towns that had been almost completely destroyed, every home had been bombed or, or part of it was missing. And um, then as it got dark and, and the trucks kept going on and on and it was real blackout, you couldn't see anything, you couldn't light your flashlight. And eventually the truck stopped and uh, the truck driver said, all out lieutenants were lost and you'll have to stay here for the night. We'll be back to pick you up tomorrow morning. Well, here was a cow pasture filled with cows and we couldn't use our flashlights, but we knew as long as the cows were in the cow pasture, there weren't any mines, so it was safe for the nurses. And when did you go to Liège? We on October we left um, we left um, um, Normandy um, in October. Again, we got on the trains, and this was three days and three nights uh, sitting sitting up in the train going to Liège, and we arrived in Liège on October 11th, 1944. And um, this was to find that our tent hospital was still under construction. Now, um, we were, ours was a general hospital that held a thousand beds, and most general hospitals were usually located a hundred miles or more behind the fighting lines. But we were part of an experiment by the War Department that wanted to put a, a general hospital in tents as close to the front lines as possible. They just forgot to tell us that we were going to be ahead of the fighting lines at one point. And now we saw the worst casualties of the war we had yet seen because of the battle for Aachen, Germany was still raging and Aachen was only 18 miles from Liège and Aachen had been uh, terrifically, it had been heavily mined and booby-trapped. And at that time I was an operating room nurse and it seemed to me that almost every patient had at least one extremity amputated. Uh, then on November 16th, oh, I'll tell you, while we were living uh, in this building in Liège, um, with all this traffic, you'd see, you know, convoys of American trucks and tanks going through from our windows, and you'd also see the Belgians, they were uh, pushing collaborators. They had found Belgians who had collaborated with the Germans and sometimes they'd strip them naked or they'd shave their heads and painted swastikas on their heads and uh, parading them through the streets. And then uh, on November 16th, uh, the Americans began a huge offensive against the Germans and our tent hospital had to be open to receive casualties, finished or not. So we nurses were trucked daily or nightly, depending on our work shift, across three pontoon bridges uh, across, this was on, on the Meuse River, um, to our hospital site um, five miles away at Fayenbois. And uh, here at Fayenbois, we encountered utter, cha utter chaos because Belgium had been inundated by these heavy torrential rains for the past several weeks. And the entire hospital site was a sea of mud. Mm -hmm. And every tent leaked. And we were forever shifting beds around, trying to keep our patients as dry as possible. And we sloshed ankle deep in water and mud on our 12-hour duty shifts and our feet were always waterlogged. We had no running water except for the water running through the roofs of those tents. We did have heat in the form of uh, 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 these same pot-bellied stoves okay. we had in England, but this time we burned Belgian coal and it really threw a nice warm heat and we were comfortable. But we had no electricity and the long, dark hospital tents were just barely illuminated by kerosene lanterns. And when we went from bed to bed uh, giving patients morphine shots, a corps man had to uh, stand at our elbow with a flashlight focused on the affected area. Because you couldn't give a shot in old flashlight? No, no. Yeah. And uh, the casualties just poured in with their uh, pale, anxious faces. You did your best to alleviate their anxiety. So many of them had uh, 
P or an S in purple gentian violet uh, painted on their forehead to indicate they had received penicillin or a sulfa drug uh, at a previous uh, station or field or evacuation hospital before they reached us. Sometimes they'd have an envelope on a chain around their neck uh, listing any medications or narcotics they had already received. So you triaged them, got them stable, and they were We got out. them stable. That was the purpose of our yeah. triage. Those who could be, uh, be given emergency treatment and sent off to duty and in a few days or maybe a week or even two, uh, we, we took care of them and, and shipped them out. But those who would need, uh, we, we kept them there, I'm sorry, but those who would need longer, more permanent treatment uh, were shipped out either to hospitals in uh, Luxembourg or France or England or even back to the States. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you relieved the anxiety of the soldiers, you know, and pain and emotional? It, it was, you tried to be very nonchalant about their injuries. It was shocking to us. But, you know, is it to say, oh, well, you know, this is very commonplace and, and it will fix you up. You're going to be all right. I mean, you just continually told them you'll be all right. And, uh, but inwardly you were sick. But we were so busy, uh, you just went from one bed to another and, and nobody ever said anything about it. But uh, you felt terrible, but you couldn't let them know that uh, how badly you did feel for them. And um, Hitler was sending buzz bombs over. Can oh. you talk about that? Oh, yes. Yes, that's uh, something else. Um, on, um, in, uh, can you just hold on sure. for a minute? No, at this point, um, I, I come to the buzz bombs later. Oh. Uh, okay. Hitler had started sending his buzz bombs uh, into Liège in November. It's an armistice disc armistice day gift for the Americans. Uh, Liège had this huge network of rail lines that went to all the surrounding countries, Germany, Holland, Luxembourg, and France. And uh, this rail line was important strategically for carrying troops and supplies. And it was this rail line that he wanted to destroy. So he started sending his buzz bombs into Liège. You couldn't see them at first, you could just hear them put put puttering along in the sky and then as you looked you'd uh, see a moving black dot and then the black dot would get as it got closer it looked like a flying cross and in the nighttime sky you could see uh, tongues of flame issuing from the ends of this flying cross and as the bomb got closer and the noise of its motor grew louder uh, you'd start to hold your breath as you mentally urged uh, the motor of this bomb to keep running because if the motor shut off before the bomb was overhead, it would plunge to earth at a 45 degree angle with a horrible whining whistle and destroying everything in its path on the ground for hundreds of feet. Its concussion could be felt miles away. Uh, if the motor of the bomb was still running as the bomb reached overhead, then it was safe for you to resume breathing. But then they came out with another bomb a couple of weeks later. The bomb had already passed overhead and you would resume breathing. And then the bomb made an abrupt U-turn and headed back in your direction. What kind of bomb was that? This was all, I don't know, but we had the V-1s at first and then the V-2s. Yeah. So I guess this was still the V-1s, but it was uh, some kind of a change they had mm -hmm. made just to confuse us. And then uh, the bombs, they were sending bombs that came from three different directions all at the same time. And the bombs came every 10 to 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. And they came for the next two and a half to three months. Our hospital was hit three times by buzz bombs, uh, killing and wounding patients and hospital personnel. We worked, slept, ate, went to the latrine to the sound of buzz bombs dropping. And you never wanted to be caught in the latrine when one was falling with four layers of pants around your ankles. Your combat pants, your pant liners, your long underwear, and your panties. 
before you even went into that latrine tent, you always paused at the doorway and scanned the sky first for any incoming objects, and you ran in, did what you had to do, and ran out still pulling up your outer layer of pants. Uh, our patients uh, hated being confined to a hospital bed in Buzz Bomb Alley, which is what they called the Liege area. They all said they'd rather be back at the fighting lines where it was comparatively quiet some of the time. Uh, then down about 25 miles southeast of Liege was a small town of Malmedy, mm -hmm. the site of the infamous Malmedy Massacre. It was here where 140 to 150 American troops were herded by the Germans into a field, and though their arms were raised in the upright position of surrender, they were ruthlessly mowed down or clubbed to death or shot point blank into the head. And the Germans cut off, a lot of them cut off their fingers and their hands, uh, not just to get their rings and watches, but more importantly to get their warm winter gloves, mm. which the German army did not have. And this was the most bitterly cold winter with the most snow the Belgians had seen in almost a hundred years. And uh, temperatures oftentimes went down to 30 degrees below zero. And the entire U.S. Army was in a turmoil. Our anti-aircraft shot at our planes. Our planes fired on our infantry. Our artillery shot at anything that moved. Uh, thousands of Americans were slaughtered, thousands were captured, thousands more were turned back. Uh, German paratroopers dressed in American uniforms were dropped to infiltrate American lines. Had and you heard about that at the time? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, well you know, the rumor mill is rife. Well, you'd hear, you'd hear okay. of this. Yeah. And other paratroopers draped in white sheets were dropped on snow-covered areas. And uh, the Germans uh, headed steadily towards Liège. One week before Christmas, uh, a sudden heavy, dense fog fell over all of Belgium. Uh, it created an eerie, gray, silent landscape. And uh, the only sounds you could hear were the muffled sounds of buzz bombs dropping. You couldn't hear any traffic because there wasn't any. And um, th this fog was so thick you couldn't see five feet in front of you. Yet the German tanks and infantry were able to move forward on the ground. And our planes couldn't get off the ground to bomb them. And the Germans got closer and closer to Liège. And we listened to the daily news reports with sinking hearts as they got too darn close. Then two days before Christmas, as my roommate and I got off night duty, we decided we were going to open our Christmas packages from home that day because surely in two days' time by Christmas Day we'd be dead. If we weren't killed by buzz bombs, then we'd be captured and probably killed by the Germans. So here we were at... Uh, Eight, eight o'clock in the morning, sitting on our cot beds in our little fifth floor chateau bedroom, um, opening our gifts, our lovingly wrapped gifts from home, and eating the home-baked goodies that we washed down with our ration of French champagne. We each consumed a whole magnum of champagne that morning, <laughs> and I must say, if the whole German army had run, come through our little bedroom, we would have been oblivious. We had the best sleep that day that we had in weeks. Hope you didn't show any patience that morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had been on night duty. Okay. <laughs> so we were, we were entitled to the sleep. Um, by the next day, December 24th, <clears throat> the Germans were 10 miles from Liège, and some German paratroopers had already been dropped into the city. Uh, many of the American hospitals in the area had already evacuated back to Luxembourg or France, and we felt like sitting ducks. Uh, we nurses were ordered to pack our musette bags with the warmest clothing we had and any first aid supplies in the event of capture by the Germans. And we were scared, I in particular, because I had an H for Hebrew on my dog tags. 
we were the ones that Hitler wanted to annihilate. And we knew from our Malmedy massacre survivor patients that Hitler had no regard for the Geneva Conventions. Our patients, the wonderful American soldier, were angry that American women were so far up front. And uh, when orders did come through that later that day to evacuate the sickest patients we had, uh, as we loaded them into trucks and ambulances, they begged us to change places with them. Uh, one of my patients was so concerned about my possible capture by Germans that he constructed a blackjack uh, for me to carry with me at all times. And believe me, I did. Uh, it was a 10 inch length of hose and it was filled with lead sinkers and it was um, uh, strung from my wrist by a leather thong. And his directions were, if a kraut gets near you, slam this blackjack across his face and aim for the eyes. Another patient gave me a spring blade knife. And he said, if a kraut approaches, plunge the knife blade into his belly, turn it, and then run like hell. <clears throat> That day, as we were evacuating our sickest patients, the fog that had hung over all of Belgium for the past week began lifting. And by nighttime, the fog had completely dissipated and a full moon arose. This moon was so full and so bright, it lit up our hospital area with an almost daytime light. Wow. And um, the painted red crosses on our tents were perfectly outlined in this almost daytime light. I was on night duty in my uh, shock tent when about eight o'clock I heard the sound of a plane overhead, something we hadn't heard in the past week because all planes had been grounded due to the fog. I knew from the sound of the motor it wasn't one of our planes and I stepped outside the tent to take a look and I was greeted by the most beautiful sight of hundreds of red flares dropping through the nighttime sky. And I stood there momentarily mesmerized by this 4th of July-like display. It was beautiful. Uh, and as I stood there watching, the plane that had dropped these flares began uh, flying back and forth across our hospital tents and nearby enlisted men's tents dropping anti-personnel bombs and strafing the tents. I ran back into my tent where my patients were already putting on their steel helmets and I told them to get under their beds. Fortunately, all my patients were ambulatory as the sickest bed patients had been evacuated earlier that day. I found an empty bed and scrambled under it too, letting out a scream as I did so. My core man, who was at the other end of the tent, called out anxiously, Lieutenant, were you hit? And I called back very disgustedly, no, only by a loaded duck. <laughs> In hospital lingo, a loaded duck is a full urinal. My patients laughed wildly at this, and it helped dispel some of the fear and tension that had gripped us all a few minutes before. Uh, the anti-aircraft nest behind our hospital opened up and began shooting at this plane, but they kept missing it, and instead we had flak coming through the tent that we didn't need. Uh, this plane came back almost hourly, all night long, strafing the tents and dropping anti-personnel bombs and was finally shot down early the next morning, a couple of miles away. Many patients and hospital personnel were wounded or killed that night. Forty of our own enlisted men were injured, some seriously, and two of them were killed. All of our day crew came back on duty to help out in the operating rooms and uh, in the tents wherever needed. It was a night of horror no one will ever forget. Did you treat any German prisoners? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And what was that like? Ah. We were did they treated it. differently? They were human beings. Yes. Christmas Day dawned bright and clear. The sun was out for the first time over a week. Of course, the buzz bombs were out on their usual 10 to 15 minute visits as they had been throughout the fog bound week. 
but our planes were out for the first time in over a week, and so were the German planes, and we watched as they engaged in dog fights not far from our hospital area as spent machine gun bullets fell around us. We saw flaming planes spiraling to the ground as we prayed inwardly that they were German planes and not ours. Christmas week was a nightmare with German planes coming over every night, we called them Bed Check Charlie, mm -hmm. uh, to drop paratroopers to uh, invade, uh, to infiltrate every American base. These paratroopers were dressed in American uniforms. They spoke English perfectly with no trace of German accent, and they had been well versed in American slang. But one subject they hadn't been taught was that of American sports, and when they were challenged by guards as they attempted to infiltrate a base, they couldn't answer such questions as who won the World Series, or who's the pitcher for the Dodgers or the Yankees. One question that could get them too was if you asked them what shoe size they wore, and if they said size 44, oh. you knew you had them. By uh, January 28th, the Battle of the Bulge was officially over. Uh, I'd like to say there was no patient on earth as wonderful as G.I. Joe, the American soldier, because he never complained. He could lie in bed racked with pain if he's, and never ask for medication if he saw that we were busy elsewhere in the tent. And then when we got to his bedside, he'd always say, take care of my buddy in the next bed first. And he was grateful for the slightest thing we did for him. He thanked us profusely. And he'd oftentimes grab our hands and kiss them. And uh, he was grateful to be in an American hospital in a bed with a mattress and sheets, items that sometimes he hadn't seen in over a year. And um, he uh, sometimes I'd come on duty um, in the morning to find a patient curled up foxhole style on the cement floor under his bed. And uh, G.I. Joe was grateful just for us being there, American women he hadn't seen or spoken yeah. to sometimes in two or three years. And G.I. Joe was uh, generous and forgiving to the crowds. When uh, the POWs would enter the tent to refill a coal bucket or perform some task, um, he would uh, motion for them to come to his bedside and hold out his pack of cigarettes and indicate that they should help themselves. And as they did so, he'd pull out from under his pillow his precious packet of family photographs and hold them out for the crowd to admire. And he'd say, my mother, my wife, my son, my daughter. And then the crowd would do the same thing. After he returned uh, the, the photographs to the GI, he'd pull out his own photographs and show them to G.I. Joe to admire. Here they were, just two human beings hungry for family and home. Uh, caring for the American soldier was truly a privilege, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my lifetime.